let's go ahead and get started. My name is Miles McNall. I am here today with my colleague, Dr. Shobaraman, or so I hope. She hasn't arrived yet. Um, I'm the Director for Community Engaged Research in the Office of University Outreach and Engagement. Dr. Ramanan is a research specialist in the Office for the Vice President for Research and Innovation. Over the next two hours, we will be presenting information and guiding you through the process of creating the key elements of a broader impacts plan for your next NSF or other funding agency proposal. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if possible, please keep yourself muted. We'd like you to use um, the Q&A function um, in Zoom instead of the chat to pose questions to me and Shoba. Uh, feel free to take a break when needed. Um, the session today is punctuated with several um, activities for you to work on. So if you need to take a break, then that's, that's fine. We're also gonna have a 10 minute break in the middle to give you a bit of a breather in this two hour workshop. And also make sure you have your worksheets on hand. Uh, you should have received um, an email from Julie uh, this morning that contains those worksheets. We're gonna use those worksheets uh, throughout the session today. So it's really important that you have those on hand. So if you don't have them ready and open right now, um, Please, please find them. Okay, so let me go over uh, the, the objectives for today's workshop. Uh, first and foremost, it's to gain a better understanding of how to design, implement, and evaluate broader impacts activities. Second, it's for you to learn more about where you can go on the MSU campus for broader impacts resources and supports. And third, we hope that it helps transform your thinking about broader impacts. So if you currently see broader impacts work as a burden, as something you have to do um, as part of submitting a proposal to NSF, we'd like to change your thinking so that you see it instead as an exciting opportunity to enhance the impacts of your research on society. And now I'm gonna change my glasses so that I have, I have the ones that are actually good for seeing things on a screen. Okay, so let's start with the basics. What are broader impacts and why are they important? Although we will be speaking today within the framework and language of the National Science Foundation and the National Alliance for Broader Impacts, better known as NABI, many of the general points I'm gonna be making making are more broadly applicable across several funding agencies. So as you probably already know, all NSF proposals are reviewed according to two criteria. First is the potential for the proposed activity to advance knowledge and understanding within its own field or across different fields. That's what's known as the intellectual merit part of your proposal. And second is the potential for the proposed activity to benefit society or advance desired societal outcomes, also known as broader impacts. So broader impacts can be achieved in one of three ways, um, not exclusively, so it could be the case that you have more than one of these in your proposal. So first, it can be through the research itself. It's quite possible your research itself will have a direct benefit to society. Second, it could be through activities directly related to specific research projects. So for example, increasing the number of students and postdocs working in your lab from historically underrepresented groups. And then third, it could be activities that are complementary to a research project, such as developing interactive activities for the MSU Science Festival that teach some of the fundamental scientific concepts behind your research to public audiences. So why are broader impacts important? Well, from the perspective of former NSF director, Franz Cordova, we need, to under, we need to engage the public in order to help improve understanding of the value of basic research and why our projects are worthy of investment. In other words, it's an argument to the public 
about why their tax dollars should continue to support your research. From a more practical perspective, as this quote from Jennifer De Bruin indicates, a poor BI plan can sink an otherwise good proposal. So the science may be great, but if the BI plan stinks, it's probably gonna harm your chances of getting funded. So where does your BI plan go in your proposal? Well, it goes almost everywhere. So it certainly should be in the project description uh, where you will most likely have a section labeled broader impacts, but it can also show up in the special information and supplementary documentation of your proposal. It could be in your postdoc mentoring plan, especially if one of your goals uh, for BI is broadening participation. It could be in your data management plan, if your BI activity involves collecting data. Uh, it should certainly show up in your letters of collaboration. If you have internal or external BI partners, you want letters from those partners. So let's say you're gonna partner with the MSU Science Festival. Well, that, well, then a letter of collaboration with the MSU Science Festival should be in your proposal. It could go in your bio sketch. Um, so if you have had past experience, particularly successful experience with BI activities, make sure that's part of your bio sketch. And because uh, <clears throat> your BI plan requires a budget, it requires money to do your BI activities, it should also show up in the budget and justification. Hi, Shoba. Glad you could join us. Yeah, I was having some problem with the Zoom link. <laughs> Sorry. Sure, no problem. Glad you could be here. So let me show you two BI examples on our campus that I know well, having been the evaluator for both of them. Uh, so the first is the NSF funded research experience for teachers program. I think it's a very exciting program. Um, so the one at MSU is run out of the College of Engineering by Wen Lee and Drew Kim. They've been doing this for years. In fact, they have one of the oldest continuously running RET programs in the country. So yay for them. What they do is they bring middle and high school teachers onto the MSU campus. Um, obviously they haven't been able to do that during the pandemic, but they will resume as soon as um, it is safe to do so. They bring the middle and high school teachers onto campus for a six week summer institute where those teachers get to participate in cutting edge research in labs at MSU. They receive one-on-one -on -one mentoring by MSU graduate students and faculty. Um, one of the key purposes of that activity is for them to develop innovative curriculum modules, which then they can import back to their classrooms. They also share them nationally um, through a platform for that. And this corresponds with the BI goal of improved STEM education and educator development at any level. And then another one I just mentioned uh, that I love is the MSU Science Festival. And it is super easy for researchers, researchers at MSU to get involved with this. All you need is compelling presentation or hands-on activity for the public. And if you haven't already done so, you might wanna consider getting involved in 2022. And I also suggest going to their website. You can see the URL for the web, URL for the website at the bottom sciencefestival.msu.edu. Uh, this, the reason I suggest going to the website is it has a lot of great tips for engaging the public in your science. So they're, they're providing this guidance to researchers who choose to participate in the science festival and it's there for everybody to look at and take advantage of. Um, so the session today is organized around uh, the six core elements of the sound BI plan. So what are your, what are your BI goals? Uh, what, who are the audiences you intend to work with? Uh, in order to reach those audiences, who will you need to partner with? And what is the setting for the BI activity? What are the BI activities themselves? What does your BI budget look like? And then how are you gonna evaluate whether you achieve um, the broader impacts goals that you set for yourself. 
Um, <clears throat> there is no necessary sequence to these. Um, people start with audiences, they start with activities, sometimes they start with goals. I like to start with goals because I've been a professional evaluator for 20 years and so that's sort of how my mind works. But that's not where you need to start. Um, and as we go through these, again, make sure you have those worksheets handy because we have a worksheet for each of, well, we have worksheets for five of six of those. So let's talk about goals. Um, so the National Alliance for Broader Impacts identified nine broad BI goal areas. And I think it's important for you to familiarize yourself um, with these to get a sense of potentially um, where uh, you want to achieve your broader impacts. So the first one, often known as broadening participation, I'm sure you've heard of this, is really about achieving the full participation of women, persons with disabilities, and underrepresented minorities in STEM. The second is improved STEM education and educator development at any level. The third is increased public scientific literacy and public engagement with science and technology. The fourth is incredibly broad. It's improved well-being of individuals in society. Um, the next um, is, is closely related to the second. This is the development of a diverse, globally competitive STEM workforce. As educators, that's what you do every day. Um, the next is enhanced infrastructure for research and education. The first thing that pops to my mind when I think about this is that is that marvelous new STEM education uh, building um, that was just created on campus. And I, I had the, the good fortune of um, being able to have a tour of that facility as it was under construction. And it's, it's really a remarkable facility and very innovative in many ways. Um, then there are partnerships between academia and industry and others. That's a, another important broader impact. And finally, we have increased economic competitiveness of the United States. So if some technology you're developing increases the US economic competitiveness, that could be your broader impact. And then also improved national security. And I know that a lot of you are doing national security related research. Um, I'm going to let uh, Shoba take over on, on the broadening participation goal because this is something that Shoba knows a great deal about. And yeah. We're going to uh, tag team this back and forth so you don't have to listen to one of us talk the whole time. Yep. Um, uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I was having some issues with my um, Wi-Fi, so I couldn't connect immediately in the beginning. So... Um, as uh, Miles laid out in the previous um, slide about the full participation of uh, minorities and underrepresented groups um, in academia, access to education, um, you know, higher education, et cetera, that is one of the goals of uh, broadening participation. NSF, um, uh, when it started the BI activities, actually this was one of the first goals they had in mind. Um, concern, you know, arose um, somewhere in the late 80s and 1990s, um, actually which sparked the diversity movement, I would say was the Hudson Institute report, uh, which said that um, women and uh, minorities have, uh, because of access to STEM and their low participation in STEM, um, the competitiveness, you know, in terms of earning and other things was, um, the gap was increasing. So at that point of time, NSF and other institutions started paying a lot of attention to the issue of broadening participation. So, um, the goal was to increase significantly their participation in academics, professions, and civic decision making. So uh, the goal was also to the full participation of women and persons with disabilities, underrepresented minority groups in STEM. Uh, they have increased um, um, 
nowadays more groups. So they added the groups such as veterans as another group. Um, they added nowadays to work with and also other marginalized groups like the LGBTQ. So <clears throat> there are a number of populations which you can work with if your goal is to um, find access for uh, such type of populations as well as, you know, put them fully, you know, access to not only education, but participation in all types of activities and their career goals too. So can we go to the next slide? Um, Miles, can we go to the next slide? Uh, <clears throat> so one of the goals of broadening participants, oh, can we go back one slide, please? Yeah, yeah, for broadening participation for underrepresented groups, it's just not simply increase of access to existing STEM opportunities. You might recruit them, but then if you do not pay attention to retention activities after recruiting them, then your goal is not really going to be successful because uh, what research has shown that um, retention is equally uh, important to keep such audiences uh, participating in higher education um, also. So not only do you need to design your STEM opportunities um, in such a way that it appeals to such audiences, you have to pay attention whether it is culturally appropriate. Um, so to make this, uh, for them to be fully participant in broadening participation activities. So uh, as uh, you know, because historically STEM -like opportunities have been designed for dominant culture populations, these type of activities might not be appropriate for underrepresented groups. So you need to be very careful when you are designing activities to appeal to um, broadening participation. You have to design such activities which need to be culturally responsive uh, to such type of population. So we'll discuss more about this in the partnership um, section. Can we go to the next slide? So um, in our last webinar, um, we had a number of partners who work with broadening participation and MSU is very fortunate that we have so many resources which you can tap into. So the graduate uh, school, uh, we have the Alliances for Graduate Education and the Professoriate, uh, which has the goal for increasing um, um, women and underrepresented groups in graduate education, right to um, increasing them in the professoriate. So they also run the Summer Research Opportunities Program, which are targeted for underrepresented uh, students at the undergraduate level. And thus, this is a great opportunity to not only work with such students, but to recruit such students for your graduate programs. So the College of Engineering or any colleges, you know, whether it is um, NatSci or social science, all have uh, diversity programs as well as outreach programs. So your college might be one of the best resources you might have to um, you know, <clears throat> find out what resources you can tap into when you're designing your BI activities. So there are also on, at MSU, we have a lot of college access initiatives. Then we also have a um, number of chapters uh, and organizations like the ACES, SACNES, NAPSI and others who you can you know, work with to tap into uh, audiences which you know you might want to engage in. So uh, we are very fortunate and these are resources which you can leverage and work with when designing your BI uh, activities and partnerships. So can we go to the next slide? I think it's a worksheet. So there is a poll. Um, yeah. 
We're gonna we're gonna um, give you a quick poll to see um, of those nine different broader impacts areas, which of those you're you're most likely to pursue. So you may select as many as are appropriate for you. I see the votes are coming in. All right, we're at about 60, 70, 76%. I'm gonna close the polling in just a second here. All right, let's end the polling, share the results. And what do we see here? Um, well, as, as we expected, um, broadening participation is a very popular goal. 64% reported that. Another 64% uh, will be doing uh, increased public scientific literacy and public engagement with science and technology, followed by increased partnerships between academia, industry, and others, improved STEM education. Um, national security and increased economic competitiveness didn't get a, didn't get a lot of votes. Um, enhanced infrastructure for research and education. Okay. Well, let's move on. I want to talk a bit about something called your impact identity. And uh, if you attended the, the BI conference on March 17th and 18th, you uh, heard a little bit about this, but I really want to dive into it and provide you with some space to think about that. Um, so Rizian and Storksteek argue that researchers can maximize their ability to achieve their broader impacts when they have first artic articulated their impact identity, second, defined their impact goals, third, developed a long-term plan to achieve them, and also obviously have the necessary supports and resources to carry out these activities. So your impact identity is located first where the driving questions of your discipline and your own scholarship intersect with urgent societal needs. So your scientific discipline, what your own scholarship and research focuses on and where those two things overlap with urgent societal needs. Your BI identity is located where those questions and needs intersect with your own personal preferences for audiences and activities. So what kinds of audiences or populations do you like to interact with, children or adults? And what kinds of broader impact activities do you find personally rewarding? Capacities and skills are another important element of your impact identity. What special talents or skills do you possess that will enable you to achieve broader impacts? Are you an effective science communicator? Are you skilled at creating hands-on activities that demonstrate key scientific principles? Are you more skilled with working with children or with adults? Do you have experience working with particular underrepresented groups? And if you don't have a capacity skill that is necessary for the BI activity, that's okay. Who can you partner with who does? And then finally, the institutional context in which you operate is another key component of your impact identity. To what extent does it provide a supportive environment for developing the societal impacts of your research? Together, these elements contribute to your impact identity and the broader impacts of your research on society. In thinking about your impact identity, it's important to think long-term not just where you'll be in five years, but in 25. Ask yourself, what will my impact legacy be? At the end of my career, what would I like to be remembered for? And what is my plan for getting there? 
So to get, a, <clears throat> to get a handle on your impact identity, let's consider potential broader impacts, the intersection of your discipline, your scholar, scholarship, and urgent societal needs. So this brings us to our first worksheet and our first activity. So what we'd like you to do is for the next 10 minutes, um, think, the, think through these questions and quickly jot down some ideas. The leading questions in your discipline, the questions that drive your own research, and where those intersect with urgent societal needs. And when you're, when you're answering question three, you might want to consider those nine NSF BI goals. Then fourth, what societal needs would I like to address through my BI activities? And <clears throat> then try to define what specific impact you would like to achieve through your broader impacts activities. If you have any questions, actually don't post them in the chat, put them in the Q&A function since this is a webinar. And we're gonna give you 10 minutes to work on this. Uh, so that means that we will see you back here at 1.37. Resume, get back to where you left off. Um, so the idea behind today's workshop is that uh, by the end of it, you should have all the major sections of your uh, BI plan roughed out, or at least some idea of what that would look like. Um, I did not see any questions in the Q and A, um, so I'm going to move ahead. Um, it's Shoba's turn again. Uh, she's going to talk to you about BI audiences, or what are the audiences that you will need to engage in to achieve your BI goals? Yeah. Uh, um, although the audience uh, implies questions on a one-way reception, that you know, you're giving a lecture and you have all these uh, students who are listening to your lecture, they could be an audience, but it's basically an interactive process. So um, uh, we're going to discuss uh, how you're going to not only uh, find the audiences you are going to do your BI activities with, but how you will be engaging with them. So, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So your BI audiences or populations can be underrepresented. Uh, minorities in STEM, women, K-12 students, K-12 teachers. Uh, they could be lifelong learners, the general public, hobbyists, uh, citizen scientists, industry, government and policy makers. So um, in all of these could be audiences or populations you could interact with. One is to recruit such type of audiences uh, to have access in STEM activities, but also retain them so they can become interested in science and keep continuing uh, you know, to work with STEM activities. For example, when we talk about citizen scientists, for example, um, there is a faculty member on campus, uh, Elise Zipkin, who does fantastic research with uh, monarch butterflies. And in one of her NSF proposals, she utilized the um, uh, citizen scientists in her work because many of these citizen scientists are very interested um, in such type of topics and they, due to their observations and collecting of data could be wonderful to partner with so that you, know, you could enhance your science and take your science to um, broader populations um, outside the campus. So, um, there could be a number of ways you can engage audiences or populations. One of our faculty members works with EELS and um, he has a wonderful partnership with one of the local schools 
in the Lansing area and he's been working with them. And think about, you know, uh, eels and electric fish. And, you know, students get very engaged in uh, something like that because, um, you know, electric fish per se are, you know, very interesting. You know, they might be icky to some people, but, you know, when you're young, you like all, you know, sort of uh, uh, strange things. So uh, he engages the population by, um, you know, working with the school and, you know, he has a fantastic program uh, with, uh, on electric fish with the, uh, with the school, which, um, you know, also works as well as not only um, keeping the, uh, the students engaged in informal science, but also think about the curriculum which could be developed on a topic like that. So, um, you know, you might also have uh, give um, TED Talks, you know, or TEDx Talks to local populations who are interested in this type of research. So BI audiences can be very varied um, and very interesting. Um, NSF, um, uh, one very famous researcher, I don't know which university she is in with, um, she does research on forestry and moss, I think, but she was able to engage the prison populations in, um, you know, getting interested in such type of activities. And so, you know, BI activities can be, as I said, extremely varied and wonderful you can engage in. So can we go to the next slide, please? So I think there is a short video on choosing a BI audience, uh, Miles. I, I think we're, we're starting to run a little bit behind Shoba. So what I was, what I would suggest to folks okay. is um, we're going to, we're going to tell you about the broader impacts wizard. Uh, this is within the broader impacts wizard. It's, it's a really interesting take on thinking about the, the different considerations when you uh, pick an audience. I, I encourage you to go watch it. We'll provide the link to the broader impacts uh, wizard a little bit later. Um, Let's see what's on our next slide here. Um, okay, yeah, this, this is still your Shoba. Yeah, um, when you're writing your BI plan, you need to be very specific what audience you're going to engage in. So the plan should include the demographics. So of uh, where this audience is in terms of location, is it going to be in a school? Is it going to be in, let's say, a nursing home you want to uh, live with an aging population or, you know, um, some gender specific location? Um, is it going to engage minority and other underrepresented populations? What income level? Uh, it could be your, you would like to work with first generation college students or uh, low income students. So you need to be very specific as to what type of audience you're going to be working with when you're writing your BI plan. Um, NSF also likes to know what, how many people you will be engaging in. So because this is very important for evaluation. So what are the number of students? Let's say if it's a school activity you're engaging in, um, how many number of students you will be working with or teachers you will be working with. So the, uh, the numbers are very important. So you need to keep a track of how many people you're going to be engaging in within this activity. And also give a rationale as to why you would like to work with this audience and why it is important to your work um, and why you, know, you have chosen this type of specific audience. So recruitment and retention, as I said, are one of the key factors in broadening participation. And so you need to say, uh, write about how you will be reaching them. Uh, will you be partnering with some of the programs which we have at MSU to reach this audience because they already have an established partnership? And then finally, what are the benefits? What are the students going to learn? Or what will this audience get out of your participation in the broader activities? So um, because uh, this is a big factor uh, as to when you evaluate 
um, you know, what will the audience gain by being part of your activity? So these are some of the considerations you need to think about when you're thinking about the audience you want to engage with. Can we go to the next slide? So um, one of the things which you need to also consider is how comfortable or competent you feel when working with your target audience. You know, everybody wants to work with K-12 students or teachers, but you, if you've never had the experience of working with them, you might not be really comfortable or competent enough to design an activities which might suit such a type of audience. The same goes for uh, underrepresented groups or historically marginalized groups, like let's say uh, students with disabilities or you know uh, veterans groups or you know LGBTQ. But luckily, we do have you know campus resources which you can uh, target, like the uh, resource center for uh, uh, students with disabilities or other groups which can help you reach to such type of populations. So also, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to give a, if your science is extremely complicated, how are you going to co um, communicate the science to um, the public audience, you know, which might not understand this. And then lastly, um, you know, science also needs uh, money to uh, be, you know, uh, research is dependent on money as everybody knows. And so you need to reach policymakers, members of co uh, Congress, et cetera, so that you can um, um, you know, talk about the importance of the scientific topic or the discipline you are in so that um, Congress and others also allocate money to such type of you know, um, scientific activities. So engaging policymakers also becomes very important. And then uh, luckily we have uh, uh, institutions like the IPSA or, you know, um, other places which might help you to make this appeal to policymakers. So uh, if you lack experience in some area um, and to reach specific audiences you might have in mind, ask for help. Uh, the university outreach and engagement um, is a great place. Uh, we have a K-12 outreach. So we have MSU Extension, the Innovation Center, IPSA, uh, and all colleges have diversity programs and outreach programs. These are another great resource for you, first of all, to tap in within your college itself. So please ask for help. And you know all of these programs will be willing to help you to engage with the audience you have in mind. So MSU has wonderful resources and you need to ask for help and you will get that help you need. Uh, can you yep, there's a uh, second worksheet. So uh, I think, uh, Miles. Sure, thanks Shoba. Um, so that brings us to worksheet two, my audiences. Again, you'll have about 10 minutes to think about this. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not um, clear on whether, you know, 10 minutes, these 10 minute time slots are too much, too little. So one thing we might experiment with is uh, when you're done with answering these two questions, just put the word done in the chat and that'll give me some sense of, of when we should uh, get going again. But uh, using your, um, your worksheets and try to answer these two questions. Um, don't, don't put too much thought into them, just whatever sort of comes off the top of your head. What are some possible audiences for your BI activities? You know, think about if these are my goals and these are the kinds of impacts I wanna have, what audiences does it make sense to work with? And then, so why is it important to work with these audiences? Um, how does that advance broader impacts and what are those audiences or populations? Um, how are they going to benefit from participating in those activities? And again, if you have um, questions, use the Q and A. Um, some people are using chat. I, I don't care. Either is fine. So, 
Let's see, <clears throat> time now is 1.50, so we'll give you until two o'clock and unless I see that everybody has put done in the chat, okay? So let's move on to the next major component of your broader impacts plan. I do not see any uh, questions in the Q&A or the chat. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, BI settings. So you have a goal in mind or goals. Um, you have an audience or audiences in mind. Where are you going to engage with them? So as this graph shows, throughout a person's lifetime, less than one third of their science learning will occur in formal science education settings. Most of their science learning will occur in informal learning environments such as the MSU Museum, science centers like Impression 5 in downtown Lansing, um, and other places. Uh, and informal science education settings are one of the most common settings for broader impacts activities. So as this table shows, compared to formal science education settings, informal settings are really quite varied. And there are three main categories of them. There are designed spaces like museums and science centers and zoos. There are programs for science learning like hobbyist groups, citizen science, library groups, summer programs, and also science media is a major way that the public engages uh, in learning about science in informal settings. One hugely popular informal education setting for K-12 audiences is MSU's extensive summer pre-college programming for youth. So some examples of Spartan youth programs from engineering are the Spartan Robotics Camp, the Math, Science, and Technology Leadership Camp, Physics of Atomic Nuclei, OsteoChams, the ANR Institute for Multicultural Students, and you can find out about many more of these uh, at the Spartan Youth um, website at MSU. ISE also occurs throughout um, science communication, which occurs across the vast array of media, reaching audiences in nearly, I mean, every demographic from young children to seniors, well, prob probably not nearly every demographic, almost every de demographic. And some examples are in print form, um, the Scientific American, which I think is the oldest continuously published um, magazine uh, directed at a general audience, science magazine directed at a general audience, the New York Times Science Supplement on Tuesdays, of course, NPR, Science Friday and Hidden Brain, uh, on, on PBS, uh, the NOVA and the Nature programs. And of course, there's been an explosion of science media on the internet. There are interactive and online games and simulations. Some of our faculty and graduate students have created some of these. Websites, mobile apps. Uh, my, my latest and most favorite uh, mobile app uh, for natural history is a program called Seek where I can actually take a picture of, of a bug I see in my uh, garden and it'll tell me what it is. Um, it'll tell me um, what species of spider I've just discovered. And then of course, some of my favorite podcasts are Radio Lab, Star Talk and Science Versus. You probably have um, some favorite ones too. Put some of those in the chat. Uh, what's your um, favorite form of um, popular science media. And then at MSU, we are gifted with um, many wonderful science communication resources. Uh, here are a few of them. So if you go to Ag Bio Research, uh, there's a nice website that provides several different kinds of science communication resources. Uh, MSU Libraries has a science communications guide that's very well developed. MSU has a student created um, science communication organization called MSU SciCom. Um, we have Dave Paulson in environmental journalism, who's an expert in how to communicate um, with the public about, especially 
um, science related to the environment. Um, University Communications has a toolbox on its website. And of course, we have WKAR that really stepped up um, during the pandemic to provide an awesome array of at-home learning resources for children and families. And of course, we have Serving Up Science hosted by Cheryl Kirschenbaum. So that brings us to uh, the next worksheet. It says two, but I actually think we're on number three, whatever. Uh, this one is, is to get you to think for five minutes, so you don't have quite as much time, to think about you know, what kinds of settings you're likely to engage um, with your audience in. So given my goals and audiences, what are some possible settings for my BI activities? Are these going to be informal or formal settings? Will they be virtual, in-person, or hybrid? Will they be synchronous or asynchronous? So take about five minutes and jot some ideas down about the settings. It's 2.06 right now. So that gives you until 2.11. 2.11, so let's move on. Uh, I am not seeing any questions in the Q&A or chat. So apparently Shoba and I are doing a perfect job of explaining everything. Um, so Shova's going to pick it up again here, talking about um, the different BI partners you might have. So if you have a particular goal in mind and an audience and a setting, um, you know, what, what BI partners do you need in order to, to reach your audience? Shova? Thank you, Miles. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so given your BI audience, one of the things which uh, we are going to discuss in this section is if you know the audience, your audience, who are your likely BI partners? For example, um, if you are comfortable with working with undergraduate students and you are thinking about broadening participation and you would like to work with minority serving institutions uh, through the AGAP and LSM, LSM programs, uh, the university has number of uh, um, MSIs we work with and have connections with. So, um, you know, you could um, tap into some of those resources to uh, find out what type of um, which uh, minority serving institution you might want to work with. Um, one of the ways which uh, NSF really likes it when you um, not only reach out to the uh, uh, minority serving institutions, but help in developing capacity of these institutions. So you might think about um, if your audience is undergraduate uh, students and minority students in particular, um, uh, you might want to go and, you know, uh, give workshops or talks on your subject matter to in these institutions. You could also work with the faculty of these institutions and bring them um, to do some research on campus in the, in the area which you are working in. The other is you might also want to have bridge programs in which you um, recruit some promising students from these institutions, for example, and bring them on campus to do summer research. Uh, but you know, you have to keep in mind that you have a budget for such type of activities uh, because uh, you might have to provide funding for them to come here to stay on campus to do um, the research activities. So uh, based on any of uh, the audiences you choose with, they're likely BI partners, you know, who can help you access such type of uh, partners and help you also um, in connecting with them. The other thing is through the LSAMP and AGAP programs and other programs on campus, they might be travel, um, um, they might have some travel funds which they can help you to uh, provide you with such funding for you to go to campuses and uh, these areas for recruitment and retention purposes. Uh, 
So uh, we have a picture on, on the slide. Uh, in the chat, can you put in what exactly this picture represents? We would like to know. Um, so um, we'll give it sort of one minute if you can identify what we have in the picture. Oh, great. Thank you, Veronica. That was excellent. You know, yeah, this is in the MSU Museum, which is, which is a um, um, science on a sphere. This is another BI activities, which you can, you know, access uh, through the museum, um, through the museum. So can we go to the next slide, please? So some of the key questions which you need to consider when you're thinking about BI partners, of course, the obvious ones are who are your partners going to be? Why are they appropriate? Why did you choose these partners for your activity which you have in mind? Uh, what do they bring to the table? Do they bring experience? Do they bring access to this audience? Setting resources, that is another great thing you need to consider because budgets are so limited. Um, you know, uh, these partners might have the resources, like um, uh, if you're interested in broadening participation, you're interested in recruiting, um, you know, the AGAP program and LSAP pro programs, for example, might have travel funds for you to do, um, you know, which will allow you to go to recruitment fairs ACES, SACNES, and others, the big recruitment fairs which are there. So you could, you know, um, go and, you know, uh, man the MSU table for recruitment purposes, and there might be travel funds for that. So you need to think about how you can leverage these resources. So um, the other thing is also you need to have an idea of how you work together to achieve your goals and objectives. So and then, you know, if you have a partnership, how will the partnership work? What type of roles will the partners play in helping you to do your BI activities? And what commitments you have to make or your partner has to make for you to achieve this goal? So sometimes it could be pretty formal. Sometimes it could be informal. You might have to have an MOU or a signed agreement uh, to work, um, you know, Sometimes when you're working with very uh, young children, um, you know, and uh, especially vulnerable populations, you might have to go through some training to work with these type of populations. And also, you know, uh, you know there might be something like background checks, et cetera. So all of these things are very important when signing agreements or MOUs, but you know, in many cases, most of the BI activities, uh, you generally have uh, informal agreements how you're going to work with. So, um, so again, you know, some of these uh, items which we have as you know, bullet points, the BI wizard uh, will take you through some of these type of activities and questions when you're picking partners for your particular BI activity. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, these are, are a very a small sample of possible MSU connectors and partners. So they're offices which support engagement. So first on the list is university outreach and engagement. Uh, there's a center for community engaged learning. So uh, you could also have the gifted and talented programs, director of the youth programs on campus, the MSU Detroit Center, the MSU Extension is a really great resource for uh, broader impacts. The offices of K-12 outreach, undergraduate research, and every college has access activities and initiatives. Then there are specifically designed spaces like the Abrams Planetarium, the museum, science festival, which we've talked about. Then, you know, horticulture gardens, the Kellogg Bird Sanctuary, if it was for natural resources. So there, um, the Broad Museum is another place. So these are designed spaces in which you can uh, 
do specific activities. Um, Dr. Shaibotan from the College of Engineering uh, works with robotic fishes. And then he had an exhibit. Uh, he worked with the MSU Museum and had an exhibit of robotic fish or in the MSU Museum, which was a big hit with um, the audiences, especially the public audiences. So there are a lot of opportunities you can work with to design um, uh, specific activities in these spaces. Then we also have research centers. So like the Julian Zamora Research Institute works with Hispanic populations and they are a great so a resource for outreach to Hispanic serving institutions. Um, MSU, um, um, you know, if you look at the demographics uh, of the population at MSU, uh, we do okay with African American populations, but you know, our outreach to the Latinx population, um, definitely you could, you know, we could expand on that. Uh, you know, for one of the programs which is really good is the TRIO program. The TRIO program looks at, you know, especially uh, they have a lot of students who belong to families of migrant uh, workers. So that is another great resource. Or the Native American Institute, if you want to do uh, reach out to the tribal populations at Michigan, the Native American Institute is another great resource you can work with. Um, so there are a number of opportunities. And of course, science media, the you know, WKAR, which was discussed, or any of the science communication um, outlets. And you might also, uh, we, ha we have, I think, local groups on uh, campus associated with campus, which do TEDx talks. You might want to participate in some of them. So there are other type of you know, activities. Uh, Miles mentioned um, in the previous slide, uh, synchronous as well as asynchronous activities. One of them is you know, the YouTube is very popular. Uh, you might have YouTube videos. Uh, the YouTube was used very effectively in science communication. Brown University uh, came out with a number of cartoons actually and animations which took a scientific concept and short animation series and these were very popular with the public audience so you could um, do some of them and then some of the mobile apps which the uh, FRIB has which you know uh, looks at you know they have mobile games you know for um, you know, they do a number of gaming type of activities to uh, make students learn about quantum physics, etc. So these are also good asynchronous activities you might think about designing. But you know, when you uh, design something in gaming, again, it costs money. So you have to connect this all this with the budgets which you would provide for doing such type of activities. So can we go to the next slide? Please. I think uh, this is a site where the broader impact, uh, the university outreach and engagement has these broader impact resources. And it's a website where you can uh, please go and you know look at these resources which we have. Yeah, that, that's right, Shoba. If you go, if you go to this uh, UOE website, um, there is a very long list of potential MSU partners that's longer than, than what uh, Shoba just discussed. Um, it, it's not exhaustive though. Um, thanks to Liz for putting another resource in the chat. Shoba, we have two questions that are pending here. Um, uh, let's, let me throw them out and uh, you can try to answer them or, or perhaps I okay. will. Um, the first one is, how can we find out what what the best setting is for our particular audience? Any thoughts on that? Um, well, it depends on what type of, um, you know, what do you want to communicate, you know, or what you're comfortable with, you know, are you comfortable with working with K-12 students or are you comfortable with working with undergraduates or graduate students or other marginalized groups? So it depends on, you know, what is your comfort level? Um, you know, 
you might want to have uh, like if you want to work with the museum or you want to work with some other thing or science communication or with you know doing YouTube videos, those are also fine BI activities. So um, it is your comfort level what you feel you can work with. Otherwise, you know, um, I think you know when you're writing a proposal, uh, if you're not comfortable with the audience you're working with, it does show in the proposal, and you might not be able to, um, you know, do a good job when suppose you're given the award to work with that audience, and you know that could be. Um, you know, for future proposals, you know, that might be an impediment. So I think for every faculty, they need to be comfortable with what they're doing, you know. If you're not comfortable with working with younger children or audiences, I think that's not a way to go. You might be more comfortable with working with undergraduate students or with uh, um, graduate students, and that is also perfectly fine. So you could, you know, design what your, you know, area of competence and, you know, your comfort with which audience uh, you need to work with. And that, I and Miles can that. help also. That is something I and Miles, um, you know, when we work on proposals can help with, you know, when a faculty come for help with their BI activities could be something which can be discussed, mutually discussed. What is the second question? Thank you, Shoba. I, if I could add to that, um, I think also, you know, when you're looking for the ideal setting for a particular audience, try to think a little bit like a market researcher. Where are you likely to catch their eyeballs? Where are you likely to catch the attention of, of a particular audience? Are they a captive audience in certain places or is there another location? Um, that they're likely to show up. Um, so, so try to think about where their attention is going and, and how it's possible to find partners in those spaces to work with them. Um, the next question is, uh, again, from Jan Monica van der Ritter, is it possible to expand a little bit on what uh, WKAR can do for us? Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take the first stab at that, Shoba. Okay. And that is that uh, WKR has done some really nice um, pieces around the work of particular scientists um, and, and sharing their science with the, more, with the more general audience. And so that's sort of a one obvious way of, of working with them. Shaba, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, the, can you repeat what the question is again? Sorry. Is it possible? Yeah, sure, no problem. Is it possible to expand a little bit on what WKAR can do for us? Um, yeah, WKAR does uh, actually actively does look for uh, spaces to promote science. And you might want to discuss with them what is your science and you know how uh, they'll, I think, help you to um, connect with a larger audience like that. So um, they, they are looking for topics, various topics. And uh, we have had, I think, um, um, the Office of the Vice President Research has been very active in promoting some of these uh, and communicating, you know, so uh, when the um, um, Flint crisis happened, the water crisis happened, we had an expert on, um, uh, that, you know, on WKR. Uh, so, you know, it's very topical and, you know, they do help out. Um, so I think, you know, it's a good way to reach out to them as, and to find out, you know, um, if the area you are um, wanting to give a talk on is of interest to them. And I think, uh, they'll be pretty much, you know, help you to do that, put the talk together. All right, that's it for our questions for now. Um, and thank you for the questions, much appreciated. Um, that brings us to worksheet three. You're gonna have five minutes to think about your BI partners. Um, so again, you're thinking about who are the folks that can uh, work with you in 
um, reaching the audience that you intend to reach and developing the BI activities. So you'll have five minutes to jot some ideas around who your possible partners are, why they would be the appropriate partners for the goals and audiences you have in mind, and then how do you connect with them? And if you don't know the answer to number three, that's fine. That's what Shoba and I are here for. Um, so it's 2.30, uh, so you'll have until 2.35 to work on this. So I don't see any questions. Um, you now have a 10 minute break. Um, so we will see you back here at 2.45. Um, so we have another question. Um, I have an idea for a BI project. My question is how likely is, is it that you get a grant when you have not done any previous BI work? That's, that's really interesting question that, that came up in a, in a recent um, conversation uh, among people at ARIS, um, which is the Center for Advancing Research Impacts in Society, it's sort of the national group of people uh, who um, focus on, on research impacts and broader impacts exclusively. And it, it's, it, it is clearly an advantage to have BI experience. And if you don't have BI experience, it's always good to partner with someone who does. Um, so that could be another faculty member, or it could be um, like, for example, if you're going to work with the MSU Museum, they have tons of, of broader impacts experience. So you can always borrow experience from other people, and that'll give your um, your proposal a better chance. What they're looking for is some significant broader impacts experience in your proposal. So let's go to the main event. And what I should say is first, before we get rolling here again, is that we are a bit behind schedule. We're gonna keep going. Um, if you have to leave at three o'clock, we're sorry about that, um, but we will post um, the recording of this uh, very soon on the UOE website and probably also the VPRI website. And uh, we'll send out a link so that we make sure that you have that. Um, so we, we've talked about um, goals, audiences, partners, settings, and, and now we're at the main event. So what is your BI activity going to be? What will you do together with your uh, partners and audiences? And um, so given the vast universe of potential BI activities you could do, I, I can't possibly list them all. I, can, I will list um, some general categories in a moment. Um, but I can give you some general advice about their characteristics and point to places you can look for examples. Um, also, the National Science Foundation has, has explicitly said it does not want to be prescriptive about BI activities. It does not want to tell you what kind of BI activities you want to engage in because it wants you to be creative. And uh, one really important point is, you know <clears throat> that the intellectual merit of your proposal has to be innovative. You have to be doing something new for you to get funded. It works the same way for broader impacts. They're looking for not the, not the same old, uh, same old, but something that's, that's new and different and interesting. And that's, that's going to get their attention. Um, and the other point I want to stress is that whatever you decide to do in, in your BI activity should be done in collaboration with your partners and, if possible, with members of your audience who can you know, be really good sources of information about appropriate and interesting BI activities. So in general terms, your BI activity should be meaningfully connected to your research. Something that, that's a BI activity that has nothing to do with your research isn't going to be looked on favorably. It should be innovative, just like your research. It should be impactful. Obviously, if it's a broader impact, it should be impactful. And it should be fun. And not just fun for your audience, but, but you. Um, because that, that makes a difference. If people can sense that you're having fun with it, they'll have a better time too. So here's a list of common BI activities. So we've talked about K-12 outreach. We've talked about uh, bringing pre-college students into your lab. Uh, curriculum development can be a form of broader impact activity. Broadening participation, Shoba told us a lot about that. We've talked about citizen science and citizen communications. 
STEM workforce development is a very common DI activity, and also developing research infrastructure. Uh, if you can get a grant to significantly build research infrastructure, um, then that, that's an important broader impact activity. Of course, the FRIB is, is the example par excellence. Think about um, the potential research that will come out of that facility over the next several decades. Think about also, um, um, can I go ahead. chip in, uh, Miles? What yes, I'm, please. Um, you know, the NSF has major research uh, uh, instrumentation uh, grants, which are also, you know, very crucial to develop infrastructure. That could be um, one thing you could pursue, uh, like the EFRIB, um, many of the infrastructure which they built, they built one by one to make EFRIB what it is today. It's the same thing with, you know, uh, some of the MRI proposals which we have. So also, you know, um, defense agencies uh, which fund proposals like the Air Force or Army also have the research instrumentation proposals which you could apply for, which you could, you know, sort of leverage within your um, NSF proposals, NSF career proposals. So um, infrastructure development uh, becomes very important and it's a great BI goal to have. So sorry. <laughs> no problem, Shoba. Um, so that that brings us to the misnumbered worksheet for my BI activity. Don't worry about the number, it's the BI activity one. Because we're short on time, let's make this a five minute exercise. Quickly jot down some ideas, given my goals, audiences, settings, and partners, what are some BI activities we can do together? I'm gonna to go back to this slide just, just to prompt your thinking. These are 12 domains of public engagement. Um, so you can see some very common forms of BI in here. Um, so for example, uh, community engaged research, performance, exhibition, and installation, P14 education and educational outreach. These are some general categories of public outreach. Now, of course, not all BI involves, involves public outreach, right? So if, you're, if your main broader impact contribution is national security, you're probably not gonna be doing a lot of, of public engagement with that. So I'm gonna leave this up while you work for five minutes on jotting down some ideas about your BI activity. And just, just to give you some uh, general parameters to think about. Um, so it's 2.52, so we'll be back on 2.57. All right, uh, we're gonna move through the rest of these slides very quickly um, to make sure that we honor your time. Um, we have a question from Veronica, and can you apply for training in an activity in order to do it? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that has to do with um, Hey, Julie, can you unmute um, Veronica so that she can ask her question? Hi. hi oh, hi. <laughs> um, I was just thinking, like, as a student, like, I'm applying for the NSF intern, and basically, like, my intern program I want to do is a broader impacts project itself. Um, and so like, I don't have a lot of science communication experience, but that's what I wanna do. So like, if I'm not personally able to, like if I don't have experience in a specific activity, but I wanna be funded or supported by the NSF for it, can I add that to like my, my grant is specific training in it or, or they wouldn't really like that? Um I'm going to let Shoba answer this because she has she has more experience um, with that than I do. I don't think, uh, Veronica, that they might support um, training for somebody you know who is the principal investigator. They will provide probably training for uh, some of the participants. Um, you know, you might want to recruit in your program. So um, if you, at MSU, we have science communication resources, um, you know, the uh, 
College of Communication Arts and Sciences might have some programs. So um, it would be better if you tap um, training from one of these sources, you know, that could be a much more a better way of making yourself competitive. Um, instead of asking, I think, uh, NSF for funds for uh, your training, because I have not in any proposals or proposals I've reviewed really seen something like that. So, but something like this could be also, I mean, I don't want to say you should not ask for training support, but um, the best way to uh, ask your program officer at NSF uh, this question, and they might be able to answer this in a better way. Um, but, you know, um, as a student, uh, you have uh, resources, the graduate school could provide you with some funding for this. You know, you, you might have to ask around. Your college might itself uh, provide you with some funding. Um, and if need be, always ask the uh, program officer for your specific program, and they could answer such a question, could email them about it. Okay, thanks. I was asking as a student, since I'm a student, so thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's keep rolling here. So um, if, you, if you want to look at more examples of broader impacts activities, we have a website for that. Um, it has a compendium of broader impacts examples. Again, it's at that uh, University Outreach and Engagement uh, BI resources page, and there's the URL at the bottom. By the way, you're going to get the slides um, sent to you after this. So we've been through um, four of those six elements, goals, audiences, setting, and partners activities. Uh, Shoba is going to briefly say something to you about budgets. I'm going to talk about evaluation, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, budget is a very important aspect of your BI activities. Um, one of the things is that um, a lot of uh, proposals get, um, do not pay much attention to budget and it's always an afterthought in some cases. So please uh, devote some sufficient resources to your BI activities. Uh, the uh, rule of thumb is at least 10% of your direct costs. Um, one of the things when you are writing your budget, suppose, um, um, you know, their activities like you want to develop a website or you want to develop um, YouTube videos or, you know, animations or games, all of these things cost money. So you need to have sufficient, at least think through sufficiently how you're going to fund some of these activities. Um, you know, so. Uh, also, evaluation is another area. You might be able to tap into evaluation resources on campus, which might not cost you something. But if you have an external evaluator, um, the external evaluator, at least you have to have about 5% to 10% of your direct cost to pay the evaluation consultant. So you need to think through some of these issues when you are developing your BI budget. and um, and you know, when reviewers are going to take a look at your proposal, they will pay attention to your budget. And if you do not have sufficient resources, that could be a matter of concern to them. So can I go to the next? Uh, so the key considerations for your BI budget are the resources, what existing resources or programs can you or your partners leverage? And as I, as I mentioned, you have, you know, if you're working with undergraduate students or graduate students, you have programs like the AGAP or LSAM, or your college might be having some uh, programs which you can leverage and work with so that, you know, uh, you don't spend your money to do these activities, but can tap into some of their resources uh, to fund your activities. Um, so, you know, you need to think about what resources your institution can provide. 
also versus you know your partners uh, who you have in this activity might be able to provide some of the resources but keep in mind for example when you're working with k12 audiences you know the school systems sometimes especially title 1 schools are pretty resource poor um, and you might have to provide all the resources to do activities in such areas so these are things which you should uh, keep into consideration when you are developing your budget. Um, then uh, the other thing when you're doing your budget is people who will be involved in conducting the BI activities and partners. Um, we discussed in broadening participation, you might want to work with uh, minority serving institutions. Again, minority serving institutions do not have very many resources and you might have to provide the resources. Suppose you are planning to bring students for a bridge program to do summer research, you might have to provide them with the research funding to do the research as well as living expenses, costs which you might you know, incur uh, for putting up the student for summer. The same thing goes with faculty you might want to bring on campus from MSIs. So, um, you know, these are some considerations you need to think about. And if you are wanting to go to some of these places for recruitment or giving talks, etc. Travel is another thing there, of course, you know, you can tap college resources or other places for travel costs. So, you know, think through some of these questions when you're doing your budget. And then the other thing when you are uh, considering is time. How much time are you going to devote and how much time your partners are going to devo devote to the program? So what does this time commitment cost them? So are you going to give participant costs? Are you going to help the teachers with some of the costs or you know, if you have student groups like the women and minorities in physics or in engineering, et cetera, helping you with the activities, you know, they might need some funding to go to these schools and come back or, you know, to provide them with mileage, et cetera, and to give some, you know, uh, on, um, you know, pay them for after school activities, et cetera. Please keep all these considerations when you're developing your budget based on the type of programming you're planning to do. Can we go to the next slide? So if you have any questions, um, uh, either put them in chat or in the Q&A, please, about the budget. And if you have, yeah. Okay, we're gonna try to get you wrapped up by 3.15 at the latest. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or the Q&A, so I'm gonna um, tackle this last section here, evaluating your broader impacts. Don't worry, we're not going to try to teach you evaluation in the last uh, 15 minutes here. Just want to make a, a couple of important points. Um, the evaluation of your project is essential. Why? Because each proposal submitted to the NSF must include a section about its intended broader impacts and a plan for assessing them. And any good evaluation should be able to answer um, these ba basic questions. Was your BI activity successful? And how do you know? What were the key goals and objectives? Was it valuable for your audience? And how do you know? Were the activities appropriate for that particular audience? And then how did your audience change? Did, they, did their knowledge of or attitudes or skills with respect or behaviors towards science change? So <clears throat> here are some expected outcomes from science communications. And I think they're broadly applicable to many BI activities with defined audiences uh, and that involve some form of public engagement. So the AEIU mnemonic device here is from Burns and colleagues. And I've added to that um, intentions slash motivations and behaviors as well, because I think those are reasonable to expect uh, with uh, broader impacts that involves engagement with the public. Um, so here um, we have uh, a sample survey 
from an event that we were very excited about, um, the Isotopes in Motion event that was a collaboration between uh, the EFRIB um, and the Wharton Center. And VPRI. And um, I, I was, I'm involved in this very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, Shoba actually wrote the uh, original proposal for this. But the reason I'm showing it to you is, it, is it, it, um, it's a simple method for assessing the kinds of outcomes that we just looked at. Um, tracking increased interest and motivation with respect to science, increased confidence with respect to science. And then the last question, um, you know, really gets at intentions and behaviors. Um, so, and you see these kinds of instruments used very frequently with broader impacts activities as you try to gauge increased interest in science, increased, in, increased confidence that a person like me can actually be a scientist. And I think that's uh, especially important for members of un underrepresented groups that they can visualize themselves as being scientists or engineers, and then intentions to uh, explore science careers. I am gonna skip over this uh, next activity interest, in, in the interest of time, but I encourage you to do it on your own time. We don't have uh, the time to do it today, but think about how you'll know if your BI activity has been successful. And when you do that, go back and, and look at your worksheets and look at the intended impacts that you uh, wrote down in worksheet one, uh, as well as the audiences and activities and think, how will I know if my BI activity has been successful? And what are some short and long-term outcomes that might be reasonable to expect and how might you measure them? Um, <clears throat> and I you know, advise anybody who's thinking about the evaluation of their broader impacts to try to reach out to um, someone for whom evaluation is, is their expertise. Um, I am connected to several uh, internal and an external evaluation networks, so I can help connect you to people, and there's my email address. Um, so please, if you're looking for an evaluator for broader impacts or simply advice on the design of your evaluation plan, both Shoba and I can help you with that. Yeah. Um, and then finally, um, just some general tips uh, for a really good VI plan. So ideally, and, and this is, you, you know, you read this consistently in the people who, um, who are expert in this area. It should be developed concurrently with and integrated into the research plan. Too, too often, VI plans read like they've been hastily tacked on at the end. And so, and so there's not a meaningful integration with the research. Um, make sure that you know, the language you use is, is unique to your proposed research plan instead of looking like some sort of a recycled boilerplate that you borrowed from somebody else. Um, it's, it's always a good idea to have the partnerships identified and the partnerships established if possible. Um, you know, before you're awarded, it's going to look a lot better if you if you have already meaningful relationships with your partners. As Shoba said, um, it's important to have an appropriate budget for BI activities. If you underfund your BI activities, uh, your reviewers are probably going to think that you're not serious about it, and they won't take your BI plan seriously. And then, of course, um, clear metrics for success. And then uh, I want to wrap up with two fantastic BI resources. Um, and I think these you'll find these very helpful. When I do uh, individual one-on-one -on -one consulting, I always ask people to uh, go get the uh, broader impacts guiding principles and questions for NSF proposals. This is a fantastic resource. It can be obtained at uh, researchinsociety.org. It was originally designed as a guide for proposal reviewers to help them assess the quality of broader impacts plans. But if you're writing a, um, a broader impacts plan, it's always good to know what criteria the reviewers are using to evaluate your plan. Um, so start there. Yes, Shoba? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just saying is that it is a great resource. Uh, I and uh, Miles are both uh, uh, members of NABI, 
Um, and you know, we both can help you um, with your evaluation plans and especially all of them who, uh, all of you who are uh, applying for the NSF career proposals, um, please use me and Miles as the resource to help you with your proposal. Um, and you know, I'm, I'd be gladly read any of your proposals and um, help in, um, um, you know, um, see if everything flows together and you know, generally help in proposal preparation. Thanks, Shoba. Um, the other resource I wanna tell you about is the VI Wizard. I urge you to go look at the VI Wizard. It's a terrific resource also can be found at Research and Society. It will step you through um, the process of creating your BI plan. So I think if you take what you've created today in this workshop and go to the Broader Impacts Wizard, you can have at the end of that, a draft of BI plan. It's got lots of interesting videos and additional information, lots of examples of BI activities. So I urge you to go there and check that out it's just been updated. It's, it's really well done. Um, I actually think it's an enjoyable experience. Um, and then as Shoba just said, we're your consultants. If, if you need help um, on your broader impacts plan, we're glad to review them. Um, I you know, plan to set apart um, part of June and July to, to do that specifically. So drop yeah. us a line and, and we'll, we'll do that for you. And then um, finally, um, we're gonna look and see if there are any questions. As I said before, the slides will be sent to you. I'm also gonna send, send you a workshop evaluation survey. Um, we wanna get your feedback on it. Um, I don't find the, the Zoom setting to be optimal. Um, so we'd like, we'd like uh, your feedback on what the virtual workshop experience is like, as well as other aspects of the workshop. Shav, I think you had a additional comment you wanted to make? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, uh, please do contact us because uh, this is a time when all the NSF early career proposals are going. So um, if you have a proposal you would like help with, please contact me by via email and we could set up a meeting to go through them. So uh, please make use of uh, me and Miles as a resource uh, to help you to be successful with your proposal preparation. Thank you, Shoba. We'll hang around and see if there are any questions. Otherwise, sure. um, you are free to go.